Hello, everyone. It's really my great pleasure to be here with you tonight. And just uh, a few words before starting, I would like to uh, thank Sophie, of course, uh, and EU Gendering, EU Admute for hosting us here tonight, and uh, also our speakers for kindly inviting our invitation, and all of you for taking part into uh, this uh, conversation. I hope it will be an interesting and meaningful one for all of us. So I will be brief. Many things have been already anticipated by uh, Sophie, um, but I will try to just uh, add um, a few uh, elements. I've been uh, working on uh, intersectionality in uh, EU equality policies and also in uh, mobilization and civil society organizing for quite a long time now. And uh, um, what I would like to underline is that 10 years ago, uh, intersectionality was almost non-existent in uh, EU equality policies. So um, it was very like in, in at the beginning of the 2000s, intersectionality or the term intersectionality, because it makes a difference. Substantially, it's something using the term is something else. So. At the beginning of the 2000s, uh, intersectionality was a very embryonic, a very implicit, and very often misunderstood concept in the few EU uh, documents that were mentioning it. Okay, so nowadays we can find the term intersectionality a bit of like everywhere in uh, in uh, in, and we will see this even later uh, throughout the. Uh, our conversation tonight, we can find the term intersectionality very present in uh, uh, the EU equality agenda. So the term has been really increasingly mobilized at the EU uh, level. Um, the von der Leyen Commission uh, has really transformed at least uh, um, in terms of uh, institutions, uh, the EU equality uh, apparatus. So for the very first time, we have a commissioner for equality, uh, a coordinator for anti-racism, uh, the union of equality policy package that we will be discussing later on to, uh, tonight, um, includes a first ever European strategy on LGBTIQ equality, and uh, there is also a new anti-racism action plan plus a specific task force uh, on equality has been set up. So if we think about like what was out there a few years ago, this looks like a major uh, advancement in, uh, in the field of equality and also in uh, how intersectionality is included. Uh, so um, considering these important institutional changes, we might seem that there is really promising step forward in how uh, we understand equality at the EU level. We might nonetheless also uh, wonder uh, if intersectionality as a policy strategy for change and social justice can actually be realized in a political and institutional context such as the EU one uh, that has been conceived and developed in a very compartmentalized way so where equality silos are still very present and equality silos are by definition antithetical to intersectionality. So I think that these are elements that we need to consider when we discuss uh, intersectionality in uh, contemporary EU equality uh, institutions, policies, and legislation. So um, as, uh, as Sophie uh, said, uh, this is a great opportunity for all of us to discuss together the uh, main achievements or <coughs> the, the, the steps towards uh, what seem, looks like a very promising um, um, new understanding of equality, but also the, the, the pitfalls, also the challenges, uh, and uh, it's very precious for us to <coughs> have the chance to have this conversation all together. So academics, policymakers, civil society, and all of you here tonight. So uh, that's uh, all from my side for now. And uh, thank you all again for being here. And sorry, and I give the floor to you for uh, starting our conversation. Thank you. Okay, now you will very soon uh, hear our experts. So I'm just here to, to launch the 
um, the debate, let's say, with a few questions. I come in the middle because actually I'm asking the questions to you, but the room plus uh, the team uh, online, so I have basically to stand here. Um, yes, yeah, so as, as uh, Serena um, just said, there are already debates on the understanding of the very concept of intersectionality. So my very first question to both of you is um, the approach to intersectionality um, that is used in your work, in your organization. Um, and so more specifically also the, the role that you give to intersectionality. Um, and how do you think it can be something useful uh, in terms of public policies? Uh, and now to be a bit more specific, because obviously our two speakers come from very um, different uh, organizations, uh, more specifically to, to Anne Pépin, uh, so when was the concept introduced in uh, DG Research of the European Commission? And it means, um, because DG Research is, um, is uh, responsible for uh, uh, fostering, promoting uh, uh, European um, research, and this means this intersectional approach, is it applied uh, for those who make um, research, so for, for, for researchers in Europe, or also as a topic potentially of research. So what does it change in, in, uh, in research? Um, and basically how material, materialities in, your, in, your, uh, in the EU policies in the field of research. And for Steffi, so I guess I will give you the floor first to answer, and then Steffi will have uh, um, the occasion to answer, and it's basically the same questions, but for, uh, for um, uh, a civil society organization working on racial uh, justice. And here, maybe from this uh, civil society uh, side, is there a consensus in the, the organizations with, um, with which you work? So within already this anti-discrimination world, is there a consensus on what is intersectionality and how it should be used? Um, and uh, because obviously intersectionality is about tackling uh, various discriminations, whether it was the concept, the occasion of collaborations between different civil society organizations or potentially of also tensions uh, uh, or uh, competitions. And with this, I leave the floor maybe uh, first to uh, Anne Pépin and then to Stéphie Richani. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for inviting me uh, tonight. Uh, and um, I think I'm going to disappoint you because we do not do <laughs> intersectional uh, research policy in DG Research and Innovation yet. It is just like it, it's the case at the European Commission level. Overall, this umbrella objective of uh, achieving a union of equality and a set of six strategies that have been adopted all have the ambition of being intersectional, but it's very much a work in progress. Just like very recently uh, um, at uh, Eurostat, a task force is being created to develop equality data collection and analysis and trying to do some intersectional uh, data collection. So it's really very much in the making. Um, what we are trying to do, so maybe let me replace because what we do is really research policy and fund research, uh, as was uh, uh, underlined. And paying attention to gender equality is really a long-standing uh, commitment in DG Research and Innovation. Uh, it dates back to 1999, and it, it evolved progressively from supporting women in science to uh, more uh, wider understanding of gender equality um, at different levels. So gender equality throughout careers in, in, in research and innovation. Uh, 
uh, gender balance in decision-making position in research and innovation, and integrating into the contents of research, into the design of research itself, uh, sex and gender analysis, which we have coined by the umbrella term, integrating the gender dimension into research and innovation content. So this built up, and uh, I would say, so in 2012, within the framework of, uh, which is our, our core policy framework for, for research, which is the re European research area, uh, gender equality and gender mainstreaming in research was set as one of the five main uh, priorities that we had to implement. With these three underpinning objective that I underline, and the approach was to do that through institutional change, have a systemic approach, uh, and uh, so promoting uh, the adoption of gender equality plans and member states supporting that, saying yes, that's one of the important tools uh, and we will uh, help our research organization and universities adopt gender equality plan and the commission will support that. And we funded many projects to implement gender equality plan. So, uh, collaborative projects. And within these projects, of course, more and more frequently, the idea of the necessity to open up to intersections between uh, sex and or gender and uh, other social categorizations, personal identities, and um, potential grounds for discrimination became clear. Increasingly, these projects uh, looked at two, two intersections and uh, that could happen in their, their specific um, fields. And uh, more and more, this word came up. <laughs> and when we proposed uh, a new uh, refurbishing, let's say, of the European research area in 2020, clearly we put in the text, there's not enough uh, opening to intersections between gender and uh, other um, uh, social categories. Uh, it wasn't yet, the, the word intersectional wasn't really there, it was intersecting with. So the, the language evolved a little bit, and that was in the commission's text. In the council, so the member states' text, it was a diversity and uh, making sure that all grounds of discrimination are, are addressed. It was this notion of um, intersection was n is, is n still not very yet uh, put forward, but it's, it's also changing. And uh, to go back to when this first appeared, it, it, it's, it's difficult, uh, honestly, for me to... to, to pinpoint that, uh, but what is for sure is that um, in, uh, in 2019 or so, when we were drafting the work programs that were going to, to fund um, uh, the topics that we were going to fund into the next framework program, which was uh, Horizon Europe, the first thing we wanted uh, to, to, to fund were, was a center of excellence on inclusive uh, gender equality. And by inclusive, we meant intersectional equ uh, gender equality and inclusion also at the geographical level because there is quite some heterogeneity across Europe at the level of uptake of uh, uh, gender equality and uh, intersectionality, of course. And uh, so this project, uh, so there's now a project undergoing and their task is really to be a think tank on how to operationalize intersectionality in policies, in, in programs, really in, in the implementation of um, equality plans in, in research and innovation institutions. So it's going on now. It's, it started uh, in, in June 2022, so it's really still a, a starting phase. And in parallel with that, we have a, a, a policy coordination uh, between representatives from ministries uh, of research and innovation 
from member states, from countries associated to the, the, the funding program, uh, Horizon Europe, and umbrella organization of research stakeholders, so umbrella organization of universities, uh, research institutes, science academies, Eurodoc as well, so, so early career researchers uh, and, and funders mm -hmm. discussing together uh, on, on how can we really develop inclusive uh, gender equality policies that, that uh, have an intersectional approach. So it's very much in the making, um, discussion at, yeah, at, at national level, and, and it's, it's really the start. Now we are, are drafting basically the next policy agenda for the European research area. And everybody, so in member states, associated countries and stakeholders said we need to, to really tackle this idea of intersectionality. How can it be really implemented and not just be what universities often call, I don't know if it's the case in this one, EDI policies. So equality, diversity and inclusion, which are very often treating the different um, grounds for discrimination in silos, like, like it was said earlier. So, uh, and, and we're fighting a little bit to, to really put the word intersectional up front and, and, uh, and not hide it between uh, the, the EDI uh, that, uh, yeah. We also have um, evidence that shows because we did some, some benchmarkings and some studies of what was being uh, developed across a member state and in um, higher education and research institution behind these EDI policies and very few at this stage are truly intersectional. Um, and besides that, we also fund, for the first time in, in Horizon Europe, it wasn't so obvious in the previous framework program, gender studied and intersectional research. So it's, it's actually, we, we managed to, to discuss with a DG Just so that they would announce, <laughs> I don't know if I should say that, but in their gender equality strategy, that Horizon Europe would perhaps require gender equality plans from its applicant and would uh, allocate funding to, to uh, uh, gender studies and intersectional research. And then we refer to that, look, we are doing it. <laughs> so to talk about this framework program, so it's one of the EU funding programs that is most advanced in, in, to, in gender mainstreaming. Mm -hmm. So now we, we require that every university, research organization, public, private, any public body that wants to receive money from Horizon Europe, needs to have a gender equality plan in place. We don't require at this stage that it has an intersectional uh, approach. In the guidance, we recommend it, we, we, uh, but it's not yet required. Right now, what is really required is very much process-based, uh, and, and we're right now doing compliance checks uh, on organization, random compliance checks to see if they at least comply with this, uh, th this uh, mandatory requirements. This is not something the other EU programs do yet. Uh, and of course, there's, uh, there are people who really want to go forward, ask for intersectional uh, gender equality plans, and others who say it's already too much, we need to simplify the requirements. So it's, it, it's policy making really, it, it, in the making. So um, what I can also say, so among these intersectional research projects, I'm taking more than five minutes, I'm sorry, but um, uh, actually one of the first topics that we wrote is called Feminisms for a New Age of Democracy. And it clearly spelled out its feminisms and all the, f the thoughts, uh, schools of thought, including intersectional um, approaches. And its core focus was also to, to find, propose approaches to tackle anti-gender and anti-feminist movements. And uh, there were so many projects submitted and of so, so, so such a quality that 
we're funding five instead of three. And all these are looking into intersectionality really uh, from a theoretical point of view and, and a practical one also, not specifically to the research and innovation community. It's more uh, at uh, the political level or, or, and societal level. Uh, so we do fund intersectional research and encourage that. Uh, we published a report called Gendered Innovation, how inclusive analysis contributes to research and innovation. And this is, contains case studies and methodology on how to do sex analysis, gender analysis, and intersectional analysis in certain cases, uh, such as in artificial intelligence, um, really in the content of research. And, and we refer our researchers to, to, to this document. Um, so we have, yeah, different, increasingly, <laughs> an attention paid to intersectionality. And, and, but as you said, there are different understandings of what it can mean, uh, how it should be approached. In our case, it's true that we start from gender and, and looking at intersections with uh, sex and or gender at this stage. And I guess, yeah, but there are many projects so funded by the European Research Council, so that's really frontier research, increasingly looking at intersectionality. Uh, on Tuesday, there was a, a conference, the annual conference of the ERC, on um, research on diversity and uh, diversity in frontier research. And still, it was a little bit in silos. Still, you know, different discrimination grounds were, were treated separately, but there were also some discussions about intersectionality. So that's our ambition. It's clear we have to, 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 to get there if we really want to, to address the, the, I mean, the, the barriers that researchers are facing on the ground. Uh, so, but we're not there, there yet, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Oriane. No, okay, so just to thank you, Anne, for, for this uh, first answer, uh, but you will have occasion, the occasion to continue on other dimensions afterward. And now we leave the floor to, to Steffi Rishani for, I guess, a, a different approach to the concept. And sorry that we are divided. I know the, the room is a bit strange, so I could not see you, but we were carefully listening to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Steffi. I would just like to start by giving maybe a little bit of a brief background on Equinox and how we work since we're not as well known as uh, the European institutions. So Equinox Initiative for Racial Justice, we're a relatively young organization. Um, and we are people of color led. We focus on advancing the rights uh, of all people in Europe and justice for racialized community. And the basis of the way we work is with sol in solidarity with a coalition of civil society working on racial justice, social justice, um, to influence EU law and policy. Um, and I think intersectionality is a really big part of the foundation of how this informs our work um, and we also focus on moving beyond individualized ideas of racial discrimination or racial hatred um, harm at the level of the individual and instead focus on how we can change structures through legislation policies um, advocacy with institutions um, we focus on five areas, so migration, law enforcement, gender, climate, one more. <laughs> and we understand all of these issues as racial justice issues. They're not separate, they are one and the same. Intersectionality is definitely the lens through which we see all these issues as part of a whole. Um, part of each other. And when we talk about intersectionality, it is easy. Somebody mentioned it being a buzzword. Yeah, it's easy to just throw it around. But I think what's really been helpful for me personally in understanding it is it's just a lens through which I can understand the current structures that already exist. And when we use that, um, our movements become a lot more unified, coherent, 
and stronger, um, well, hopefully. And I think this is becoming increasingly obvious. Um, it's not just at the institutional level, if anything, I would say generally, and people, and especially younger people, are moving much, much faster than most institutions um, on this, and let alone policy making. Um, and maybe I can reference just a very recent example, which I think most people saw and is really indicative. Um, Greta Thunberg was at a climate rally in the Netherlands. She referenced um, events in Palestine and said there is no climate justice on occupied land. She was then interrupted uh, by somebody, um, an older man, uh, who said that he was here for a climate rally and not political opinions. I think this just really underscores the two levels of public discourse at the moment on understanding intersectionality, understanding how we approach all of these different issues. Um, as we all know, war is not separate from displacement of people and therefore migration. And it's not separate from the impact on air and soil from weapons being used and so is therefore relevant to the climate. Climate cannot be challenged unless we understand this policy ambition of infinite growth, um, resource extraction, and colonialist expansion. And it's the reason we have climate change today, <laughs> which has made many parts of the world unlivable and will eventually lead to mass displacement. So it's really there, these things are inextractable from one another. Um, and then let's say migration, because that's another topic we work on. We can't fully understand migration unless we address the root causes that lead to migration. Instability, poverty in the global south is directly caused by global north history of colonialism and extraction. So just because we can understand these intersections on a theoretical level or like a conversational level, and now finally I would say it's at the point where this is entering mainstream conversation, um, it doesn't mean that our policies are effectively designed to address them. Um, so that's the, the core issue that remains for civil society at the moment, is that it is great to have intersectionality um, being you know, front and center of the concept of the anti-racism action plan, but to what end? Where, where is it leading to? What is the actual concrete policy development that will ad address these issues um, appropriately. Um, and then, I'm sorry, you mentioned something about consensus, if I have time, consensus sure. within civil society. Oh, yeah, you have plenty of time. Um, <laughs> good. Um, from my opinion, I would say, no, there's pretty pretty good consensus in civil society that, that intersectionality is a very useful tool for, for understanding how we can fight for our common goals. Um, we don't have this kind of woke, anti-woke discourse within civil society that is sometimes used um, politically as, you know, just a stick to beat each other with. Um, but probably there is less consensus with how we design policies or what are our policy goals um, and how we advocate them to the European institutions, to national governments, to whomever. Um, and so that is definitely less coherent within civil society. And in my personal opinion, the, the core division down the line is organizations or people who, who believe that the current system can be reformed um, we call these reformist reforms. Um, and those who would like to reimagine and recreate it completely, um, which is probably more some of the others of us. And um, again, this is my personal opinion. Um, if we're to use intersectionality as a framework, as an understanding, as a lens, um, to help civil society goals, I think it should lead us to be as radical and imaginative as possible in our demands for justice and equality. Um, and intersectionality helps, intersectionality helps us understand how to get there and how we talk to people about it, but it's not, it's the starting point. It's, it's not the be all and, and end all of um, policy making. That's it. Lots. Yeah. 
It's very beautiful uh, sentence that you use at the end, this being radical and imaginative. So um, I will uh, briefly, um, yeah, uh, before, before uh, asking the second questions to our speaker, I would like to yeah, underline how uh, I find it very fascinating, the two different uh, perspectives. So from the uh, European Commission side, we have uh, intersectionality as an objective to be reached. And uh, from the civil society side, I, at least from the Equinox side, uh, I, I, the way I understood it is that intersectionality is actually a starting point. So she, Steffi was using the term lens. The, the term I always use is a power conscious way to look at the world. So you need uh, to have the, this conception and idea of intersectionality already rooted before you start. But it's interesting to, to be here and to see how it, it can actually be interpreted in two different ways. Also, given the institutional background that pushes in that direction, of course, we cannot only, we cannot ignore that. Uh, so um, I would like before, uh, the second question is mainly addressed to you, Steffi, and then uh, if you want to react to what's, to the point of view again of Equinox of Civil Society, that would be um, highly welcome. So uh, the second question concerns main, mainly the current policy, so on the union of equality, uh, the Union of Equality, for uh, those of you who are not familiar with that, is uh, what I call a policy package because it entails five different strategies, so five different equality strategies on uh, uh, gender, uh, LGBTIQ, anti-racism, uh, rights of persons with disabilities, and finally uh, the Roma. So these are the key uh, five uh, strategy focus that the uh, union of Equality uh, has. In the Union of Equality, um, the objective is to mainstream equality in all EU policy initiatives through an intersectional perspective. And indeed, intersectionality is uh, uh, considered a core cross-cutting uh, cross principle. And in fact, intersectionality is mentioned explicitly. So the term intersectionality is explicit in the five, in all the five uh, strategies. And also some specific interactions among the strategies are indicated as examples of an intersectional approach to equality mainstreaming. Um, what I also found very fascinating in like listening to the two of you uh, in terms of really perspectives on intersectionality is that um, the uh, EU institutions, the Commission in particular, and these strategies in particular, they are very much based on uh, a gender first principle. So like on an understanding of intersectionality that is actually corresponding to what Anna just said. So uh, there is gender and the intersection of gender with other things. This is, uh, has been often in, in recent years contested by civil society, but also by academics. So I think this is a perfect setting for further discussing this issue. So shall we put gender first? Or is that antithetical again, uh, intersectionality and the very concept of intersectionality? So just uh, some uh, questions for, for us to further discuss later on. So, um, I would like to conclude this short introduction with uh, some criticism that have been raised from uh, CSOs. And uh, here, for instance, I'm using an expression that Inner was using when the gender, the current gender equality strate strategy was published. So they, um, they published a short statement saying that it's very positive that uh, intersectionality is there, but still it's a failed opportunity to be truly intersectional. Okay, so this is the, uh, I think, a bit uh, something we could st start uh, with for uh, this second question. And uh, of course, we are waiting, uh, eager to listen to you as well. So the second question is, how do you assess the actions taken by the EU on the question of intersectionality up to now? And uh, is that the right approach? Is that enough? So thanks in advance. I think you can all guess what I'm going to say. Um, where to start? Um, maybe just some examples to really illustrate 
the changes from initial equality legislation at the EU level uh, to now and how despite all of this progress and improvement, we're still very much nowhere near where, um, in my opinion, we should be. Um, the landmark legis equality legislation at the EU level for racial equality is the Race Equality Directive. So this is from the year 2000, um, and it still very much shows where the conversation was 20 years ago. Uh, racial discrimination or racial hatred manifests on the personal level. Um, it is not structural or systemic. Um, and even though it has a lot of provisions to combat discrimination, it, it simply doesn't go far enough. Uh, recently, about a year ago, I think, uh, the commission opened an, a study um, to evaluate the... Um, uh, whether or not the Race Equality Directive was still fit for purpose in 2023. Um, and it found that it wasn't. Um, that's not what they said, but they said <laughs> um, that they found discriminatory law enforcement practices constituting the main area outside the material scope of the Racial Equality Directive. So in 2023, where most of our most of the motivation for combating racial discrimination was a direct result of Black Lives Matter uprisings in 2020, which eventually led to the Anti-Racism Action Plan. The landmark legislation does not have any legal provisions to hold um, police authorities or enforcement, uh, law enforcement authorities accountable for racial discrimination. Um, so there's that's one of the gaps that uh, was left by the racial race equality directive and there uh, another uh, one is that it also doesn't include provisions for nationality based discrimination so for a third country nationals it's also like a whole other issue um, which brings us to 2020 and we had the the um, von der Leyen commission present as part of the union of equality the anti-racism action plan and lo and behold intersectionality was in the opening paragraph, I think, even, which is crazy to see how far we've jumped in 20 years. And I don't want to downplay the importance of that, uh, the fact that we're even having these conversations. But at this point in time, I think the anti-racism action plan is at best well-intentioned and realistically Presenting um, the ideals and the beliefs of, of intersectional um, analysis without truly upholding its principles. Um, it also runs out uh, very, very soon, and we'll have to contend with not only renewing it, which is going to be a challenge enough already, but also making it stronger. Um, some of the um, provisions in the anti-racism action plan go further than the race equality directive. For example, it does include reference to uh, policing and systemic and structural racism. However, it, there's not a single mention of migration policy within anti-racism action plan, which to most people is kind of contradictory, seeing as a huge amount of violence and discrimination at the hands of not just national law enforcement authorities, but now also an EU agency, Frontex, um, is racial discrimination against migrants. Um, so I think this just illustrates again how institutions are in a place where they do recognize that there is structural racism and they you know, seemingly want to address it, but it's not really reflected in the concrete policy ambitions or goals of, of action plans or directives. Um, what it does instead is actually refocus on using criminal law as a solution to racial hatred. And this is part of a broader trend towards criminalization in all areas. Um, it is the reflex of institutions to default to somebody was racist, let's put them in jail uh, without addressing the root causes of how this was allowed to happen. Um, again, very, very individualistic and not so systemic. Um, and this has led to what we see now through, the, let's say, a migration uh, context, which is this overarching 
intense focus on securitization and security policy of every single issue. Migration, that's a security issue. Climate refugees, that's going to be, that's a security concern, and we have to put more money into law enforcement and into guns or something. Um, and it really represents the carceral, punitive, criminal law approach to what are essentially administrative or social issues. Um, and that's kind of where we're at with how um, parts of civil society view um, intersectionality in EU policy, which is to say, again, simply a starting point, just a reference, um, at best an acknowledgement, unfortunately. But yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And would you like to react or to share some thoughts with us? Uh, I can try. Thank you. Um, uh, I remember when we discussed the, the anti-racism action plan, actually, in an inter-service group. And uh, yeah, for some people, we had to insist, you know, to put intersectionality in. Uh, for others, uh, I mean, there was, in, in the end, there was a lot of support, but even in, internally in the commission, there are uh, yeah, different understandings, di different uh, levels of awareness um, but often because you're comparing um, commission documents or so communications and directives and those are really different beasts <laughs> a directive it's it's really uh, um, it can be a proposal by the commission and then it's discussed by the parliament and and by by the the council and usually you have the parliament, at least this parliament, that will even go, go further, really be more radical uh, and with a lot uh, of amendments. And then you will have the council that will do the reverse. Just go back, go back uh, and, and uh, remove gender, remove intersectionality. So, and then it's, it's, it's really a political uh, yeah, negotiation uh, into into trying to 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 be as progressive as possible, but uh, yeah, it's it's not uh, that easy, <laughs> let's say, uh, when you're inside and trying to to advance things. Um, then uh, what can I? What else can I say? I can. So I'm talking. So so that's general. One good thing with the task force on equality is that you really have to nominate an equality coordinator for, for each of the directorate generals. I'm the one uh, for, for DGRTD. And we have regular meetings, and we are invited to all uh, provide input to, to inter-service consultations and uh, inter-service groups uh, around all these uh, equality strategies. So th that's, it is uh, something different from uh, uh, when I, I first got into the commission, so there, so things are evolving, <laughs> uh, but it does take time, and it's true that. Uh, but that's maybe for the next question: <laughs> what will happen with the European elections? That's a, a big worry. Uh, of course, uh, we're all trying to advance as much as possible in in what we're, we're trying to to put in place. Um, Let's take, like, in Horizon Europe, as I said, we do fund, like, fundamental research on, on intersectionality. Uh, so that's in the core program. It's also uh, in the European Research Council uh, program. There's uh, one project, for example, called Gen Gendai that looks at health inequalities with uh, really looking at sex, gender, race, and social class with no uh, given priority order and trying to build up quantitative analysis. So, I mean, there are many exploratory projects trying to, to explore this and, and really to, to advance on, on the knowledge. Um, we're also at a policy level uh, for example, so I talked about this evolution of our, our gender equality plans, which was quite honestly a, a groundbreaking moment when uh, 
uh, we decided to impose that on applicants. Uh, really, so saying you will not receive any money if you don't have a, a research, uh, I mean, a gender equality plan in, in uh, your organization. But to also try to incentivize uh, the, the, the shift towards a more intersectional approach, we created a, a, a price. Okay, it's a price, but it's still 100,000 euros uh, for academic institutions that can show progress in changing the situation in the ground uh, uh, through an intersectional action plan. So uh, we started that last year. This will be the second edition. So we're, we're trying at different angles <laughs> to, to advance on the policy uh, and advance on, on, the, on the concept itself and, and how to operationalize it. Um, but I can surely understand <laughs> that's, that there is some impatience in, in, the, in the civil society. I mean, it, it's true that we, we need to, to advance on that, but, uh, but sometimes, yeah, you, it has to go step by step. You can try to push as much as possible, and sometimes uh, it works, and then sometimes you, you, you go backwards, it backslides. But yeah, we still have to fight sometimes very basic things uh, of certain uh, countries that uh, say we don't sign that if you keep the word gender. For us, gender, it's, it's uh, only equality between the binary uh, women and men. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's a negotiation. Yeah. I can just confirm that here we would not have a gender equality plan if, if it was yes. not required by the commission, that's for sure. Because, mm. yeah, being in the meetings when it was accepted, I, 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 yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you. Actually, you just used, I, I will stand up. I hope people can still see me on, uh, because otherwise I have this uh, pulpit in the middle. Um, um, yes, uh, just to, indeed, you, you just mentioned the word backsliding. So when we talk about the future elections and the potential democratic backsliding going further uh, in different EU member states. But before talking about the future, just um, to go back on things that have been mentioned. Um, First, it's more specific, but I wanted to make sure that it's related. You, in your first intervention, uh, Anne, you mentioned um, equality data collection precisely to materialize certain discrimination. And uh, it is one, I think, of the progress of the, this um, EU um, uh, action plan against racism. So I was first wondering very more technically, but whether this is a consequence in your policy field, so in research uh, of the action plan, or this, or if this uh, the work on uh, equality data. So basically, equality data. It's the fact of collecting uh, concrete data uh, on different types of discrimination, um, because without this data, you cannot uh, see those intersectional discrimination. So I think it is, I know this is very high on the advocacy agenda of a civil society organization, and I was, I was interested to hear it. Um, yeah, so if you can just react on this and then uh, we'll have further questions. No, I think the, the, the realization that we need to collect that data dates it's, it, way back, but, it's, but even to put in, in the, the gender equality strategy uh, the possibility to require a gender equality plan and we will fund gender studies and intersectional research. It came from us. You know, we wanted just to put that in to, to, to also um, then say, look, it's in there, we have to, <laughs> to apply it. I mean, that's, that's the way you also build policy and uh, uh, build a virtuous circle. Uh, but... Uh, uh, no, it, it dates to, to further back than, than that, but it's, uh, it's, it's not that easy. But actually here I have, I, I printed out, 
because we have we funded i would say the first large project on gender based violence uh, including sexual harassment in the academic field and there was a, a, a prevalent study uh, that had a, an intersectional angle and about 42,000 staff and students from across uh, Europe answered the survey and, and actually the level of prevalence of any, uh, like at least one type of gender-based violence, it's crazy, it's like 60%. But uh, I looked at the question that were asked and so there were questions about sex uh, at birth, uh, gender identity, um, whether the gender was the same as the, the sex assigned at birth, the age, uh, disability, so one was titled minority, do you consider yourself to be a member of a minority ethnic group? Sexual orientation, so I can um, tell you what type of question were asked, but also then educational level, main field of study, so mobility, uh, residence, and I don't know if this one had whether you have caring responsibility, so we're and what came out, of course, is that there's stronger gender-based violence uh, for, uh, for LGBTIQ population, for disability or chronic illnesses, so nothing really sur surprising, but at least it's an attempt more and more to try to, to build trust also for people uh, anonymously uh, to, to, to share uh, that data. And... Uh, and um, yeah, also involve the people concerned. And, and when we you draft that type of a of questionnaire, or so yeah, that's something that we increasingly try to implement in our project. But uh, like I said, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> Just because regarding working, no, not anymore. Yeah, it's the battery is probably dead. Uh, no, it's just obviously equality data has been important, I mean, for a very long time, but it's also that um, legally in certain member states there are big res resistances, yes. uh, structural resistances, because you were just mentioned, to ask someone about its uh, religion, his or her religion, uh, yeah. ethnic origin is simply illegal in certain contexts. And in this sense, yeah. it's still a, a battle, even though it's obvious for a lot of people yes. Uh, it still remains, uh, so that's why it was uh, apparently something that came back in the action plan against mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe to give the floor again to, to, to Steffi, but it's a very open question. It's uh, the one of the future. Uh, so now you already mentioned all the limits that are uh, quite obvious in those, in those different either, okay, directive or, uh, or plans, which indeed are different types of, 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 uh, of documents. But um, I was mentioning the democratic backsliding, um, maybe more concretely with those elections coming, uh, if we look at your specific um, organizations or the coalitions of, of uh, organizations, um, are they, what are your main objectives or uh, in this context that is indeed a bit, um, I mean, doesn't look that good, let's say, for, for equality and diversity in Europe. Uh, so here in, in this perspective, is intersectionality something that uh, you will use in your campaigns, in your, in your dialogue with, uh, with the institutions? with the parliament and the, fu the future uh, parliamentarians. Um, and the big question, and again, it's for both of you, but in this concept, uh, do you see intersection intersectionality as a, a sustainable uh, principle and, and ID in EU, in EU policies? And then you are very welcome to address uh, different dimensions. It's very open. So maybe Steffi, please. Um, just to quickly do um, make oh. just to quickly mention um, that uh, about equality data, yeah, absolutely, it's a core demand of civil society. It's incredibly useful, especially equality data that is disaggregated by race. I don't exactly know what that entails because I'm not a researcher. This is, but this is a core demand of civil society because 
otherwise then we don't have the full picture so yeah i just wanted to reiterate that um yeah it's pretty scary looking at what has happened at the national level in some eu countries and what will potentially come down the line in 2024 um we're really at risk of losing all the things that took so much time and so much work to achieve. Um, I don't mean to be pessimistic, um, but I think if we hold on to what we already have, that will be good, depending on what the European Parliament will look like. Um, as Anne said, um, or implied, sorry, like the EU is the sum of the national countries that make it up. And we have to contend with uh, a council that enters negotiations on behalf of the member states and their goals. And if we also have to face a parliament, I guess, that is increasingly right wing, increasingly reactive, increasingly, you know, anti-immigrant, anti-woman, anti-LGBTQI, then it's like opening a second front. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's not looking great. Um, you asked a question on whether it was sustainable to keep advocating for um, intersectional policy making in that situation. I would, um, if you allow me to be provocative, I would say that it's the EU that will not remain sustainable if we don't have true intersectionality in policy making. We keep hearing about the union of values and the union of human rights, and I want so badly for that to be true, but we have to live up to it. Um, we have to live up to that the, this image that we make, and without a real application of this intersectional framework or this intersectional lens to human rights issues in all areas, all policy goals, all policy ambitions, yeah, the the, the small modicum of justice or progress that we have earned or that we will earn will remain incomplete and remain exclusionary by default. So, yeah. Um, yes. And maybe... Yeah, this way, okay, it works. Uh, Anne, if you... Then we can maybe... We will open the floor uh, to, the, to the audience. Uh, but, yeah, if you have some remarks on this uh, not-so-bright well, future, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, what I can recommend is vote. <laughs> Just vote in the European elections and tell everybody to, to vote. I mean, uh, and the young people in particular. Really, in some countries, you can vote in the European elections at 16, I think, or 17. I mean, it's... So, and, it, and it's mandatory, no, to vote in Belgium. So, <laughs> but it's not so many people in Belgium. <laughs> but... Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it could be scary, but uh, so uh, it's, it's, people do need to vote. Uh, and um, on the commission side, I th think we, the, the momentum is there and, uh, and the strategies are until after so much of them, m most of them are until uh, 25 or 27 even. So um, that's after the, the, the European election and the, the, the new college of commissioners uh, that we will have. So there will be some continuity and, and, and there's a knowledge that has been building up uh, within the commission services, so I don't see that uh, disappearing. Um, the the opening to <laughs> intersectionality, but yeah, we we have a lot of work, <laughs> a lot on our plate, <laughs> and uh, and hopefully uh, there will be better times. <laughs> so. Yeah. I don't know what to really add that, uh, again, uh, tell people to vote. Sniffy <laughs> uh, uh, just wanted to add something. Oh, just very quickly about voting. Uh, yeah, my hopes are high. In 2019, I think it was the highest uh, turnout in, you know, 40 or so years or, or yeah, 20, 20 years. years. 40 is too much, yeah. 20 years. Um, 
And I think that's great. I think there's more young people engaged than ever. Um, hopefully that also manifests in every national context as well. Um, but just to add one more thing, electoral politics is just one avenue we have of changing structures. I think it's super vital. This is just my opinion. I don't think it's, I don't know if it's like- No, I, I agree, but, but yeah. it's- <laughs> But yeah, I'm, I'm also agreeing with you. <laughs>